this is going to be our final session, and it's going to be on housing and the macroeconomy. Uh, and this session will be moderated by Victoria McGrain, the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Victoria. Hi. Um, joining me on the panel is uh, Deborah Lucas, Assistant Director of the Congressional Budget Office, uh, Todd Sinai, uh, Professor at the University of Pennsylvania, and uh, Sten Van Neuerberg, is that close enough, um, from NYU. Hmm? Oh, sorry, and Atif Mil from the University of California, Berkeley. Sorry. Um, unfortunately, Stuart Gabriel from UCLA was ill and would, is not able to join us today. So I think we're going to start off with each of the panelists uh, speaking for about 15 minutes on their particular research and topic area. So in my opening round of comments, I'd like to briefly talk about some of the big picture links between housing, the real economy, and asset markets. And I hope that my uh, fellow panelists will elaborate on uh, aspects of that link. Okay, so I'll talk basically about uh, some basic facts that I think are first order by th in thinking about housing and the macro economy. Then I'll uh, propose a you know a theory, quantitative theory for explaining the boom and the bust in uh, U.S. housing markets. I'll talk a little bit about housing and the macro economy today, and then uh, just um, try to introduce some principles uh, for reform of housing policy beyond uh, GSC reform, which we discussed this morning. So some basic facts about housing, I think, first of all, if you look at your own portfolio, you will probably uh, find for many of you that housing is by far the largest component of it. In the aggregate, um, as a fraction of net worth, U.S. households uh, held about 33% of their portfolio in housing in 2000, but that number skyrocketed to 48% in by 2006. So housing is not only a large fraction of households' portfolios, it's also a volatile component, something that probably many people underestimated. Now, this uh, wealth creation and the boom uh, amounted to about $14 trillion, or, or basically what GDP is today. So it's just a gigantic wealth creation. The second aspect of housing is that it's not just an important investment good, not just an important consumption good, it's also a key collateral asset for housing. So if you look at debt in the U.S. economy, uh, and household debt in particular, the, the bulk of it is really securitized or collateralized by housing assets. So this um, mortgage debt has increased um, as tremendously as well, um, from 54% from, uh, of GDP in 1996 to about 89% in 2006. Now, that's just a number, but that's in fact a staggering number. If you look at the picture here, uh, you see the red line is mortgage uh, debt to GDP. And you see that um, this is part of a, a trend that started back in the 50s. So there's basically been an acceleration of, of mortgage debt buildup in the U.S. system uh, ever since the post-war period. Now, some of that is presumably due to technological innovations um, in, in, in lending, uh, the, the rise of securitization, and so forth. But, um, but probably, and I'm going to come back to this, the acceleration that took place uh, since the mid-1990s is clearly uh, kind of a deviation from this slow, long-run trend. So just as a remark, this 35 percentage point increase in the last, from 1996 to 2006, that's as much of a rise as all the previous rise uh, prior, prior to that. So it's truly staggering. It represents about six uh, trillion dollars. Now, with, with this debt buildup has been basically a decline in home equity. So that's the blue line. That's basically what fraction collectively American households own of their houses. So that used to be close to 90 percent in, in the 50s. Then it was about 70% for a long time, and then it, that fell to 60%. Now, throughout the boom, this number has basically been flat. Now, that's a bad thing because you have this massive uh, housing wealth accumulation, and the fact that that line is not rising means that households are basically proportionally taking out more debt uh, instead of accumulating home equity. Now, the third important fact about housing, I think, is that house prices really had this kind of unprecedented boom and bust. So this is not just true in absolute levels, this is true relative to what we would consider measures of fundamentals, like median household income or rents. I'm going to be looking at the price to rent ratio in the U.S. economy. So that number um, went up, depending on the source of data, between, so anywhere between 34 and 57 percent from 2000 to 2006. And then it subsequently fell to uh, you know, somewhere between 14 and 33 percent um, all the way to today. Now, this is, a, this is really a dramatic shift, but it's, it's kind of interesting to, to recognize that it's, it's not an outlier across the world. We've already uh, discussed this a little bit. Other countries like Ireland and Spain have seen similar, if not uh, bigger, booms and busts. 
So here's a picture for the US, and these house price to rent ratios are normalized to be 100 in the year 2000. And so you see previous booms and busts, like the one at the end of the 70s, the one at the end of the 80s, but they were a lot more modest in, 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 in magnitude. The, the boom that started around the mid-1990s was really um, unprecedented in US history. And just to kind of appreciate how much of an outlier that was, uh, you know, Robert Schiller at Yale University has gone back hundreds of years uh, and, you know, has basically argued that the real price of houses doesn't really go up by much more than a percent per year, whereas we saw kind of real house price appreciation in excess of 10 percent per year uh, during this period. So I think a key question that uh, faces macroeconomics is, you know, what explains this enormous boom and bust in U.S. housing markets and, and markets across the world? And that's a question I tackle in, a recent, in, in recent research with uh, my co-authors, Sidney Ludwigsen and Jack Favilukis. And maybe surprisingly, what we find is that a relatively standard macroeconomic model uh, can actually account, a rational model, can account for this rise and fall in U.S. house prices. Now, the model is really predicated on two ingredients, which we think um, have ample basis in reality. The first one is uh, a really dramatic financial innovation or um, of um, or financial market liberalization, if you like, in mortgage finance. And the second one is a huge foreign pur purchases of U.S. treasuries and agencies by foreigners. So let me elaborate briefly on both. So the first one is improved access uh, to borrowing for many first-time home buyers. So the, in the boom, we had all kinds of new products, subprime, Alte, option arms, that um, really allowed households that were previously crowded out of housing markets to finance um, a house and to become first-time buyers. Now, this was partially um, realized through higher maximum allowed loan-to-value ratios, lower documentation, lower underwriting standards. I'm sure Atif Mian will kind of elaborate on this aspect of uh, the data further. And, you know, it's important to point out that the GSEs were important supporting actors in this whole mortgage uh, credit boom creation. The second aspect of this financial innovation was that the cost for anyone in ta of tapping into one's home equity fell dramatically over this period. So basically, mortgage, not only mortgage origination costs, but also mortgage refinancing costs, home equity line of credit uh, origination costs and so forth, fell a lot over this period. Um, you know, and in addition, people were just made much more aware of the potential to tap into their home equity. The second fundamental shift that we've seen in, in the US economy is kind of uh, these foreign purchases of US treasuries. Uh, if you've never seen these data, this is truly staggering. Uh, foreigners are now holding about two-thirds of outstanding um, marketable government debt. If you put that in, 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 in dollars, uh, and that's the, the blue line is, is treasuries, the red line is agencies, you see that foreigners are now holding about $4 trillion worth of our U.S. treasuries and about a trillion and a half of our uh, agency debt for you know, a grand total of five and a half trillion dollars. It's safe to say that without these purchases, we wouldn't have seen kind of the low interest rates um, of, uh, of the boom period. So basically, this, com this combination of, of um, these massive tre treasury purchases and agencies depressing interest rates um, with the relaxation of credit standards, you know, quantitatively is enough to explain this kind of um, 30, 35% rise in, in, in home price valuation ratios. So then how do we think about the housing crash? Well, we think of it as a reversal of, financial, of this financial market uh, liberalization in mortgage markets. So basically, we think of it as credit standards went back to their pre-2000 levels. Um, you know, and again, there's ample um, evidence for that, that there are now maximum loan-to-value ratios went back down, costs of tapping into one's home equity went, went back down, and, and of course, there's basically no more private label securitization market out there to, to um, so that origination of, of, of uh, the raw material for the securitizations has also dried up. The one thing that hasn't changed, uh, fortunately, for the U.S. economy is, is these foreign purchases of U.S. treasuries and agencies. If anything, those have accelerated um, with basically a net increase in foreign treasury holdings of, of almost $2 trillion just in the last two years. The one thing that did change is that agency holdings are down uh, a little bit, uh, $300 billion over the last two years. And I think it's in part, uh, you know, basically foreigners like the Chinese and the, and the Russians getting nervous about whether the U.S. government was going to honor these agency bonds that triggered um, the, the HERA legislation in the summer of 2008 in the first place. Okay, so what, what are some of the other insights from our analysis in, in, in addition to, you know, we can kind of explain these house price, house price swings. 
Well, first, that foreign purchases are instrumental to keep the, the interest rate low, and we're, we're instrumental in to keeping interest rates low. But in fact, that they only had modest effects on house prices. And this is often something that's not appreciated. So uh, Chairman Bernanke of the Fed, for example, has gone out, out um, in speeches directly linking the low interest rates to the high house prices in the US economy. Now, what we find in our research is that the same forces that lower interest rates often increase risk premium. So basically, the foreigners, by buying our bonds, they are forcing domestic US investors uh, into, into riskier assets, and investors are going to demand a higher risk premium to hold on to these assets. So that's why um, you know, the direct link between interest rates and house prices is smaller than one might think. Now, this could be good news to the extent that we believe that mortgage refinance is going to increase mortgage interest rates that will lower house prices, but maybe not by as much as we fear. Um, another point is that these house, high house valuations in 2006 signaled lower future prices, not higher future rents. So people were often thinking, well, these valuation ratios make sense because rents are going to go up in the future. But in fact, um, you know, house prices fell. And uh, financial innovation in the mortgage market uh, obviously fueled a large consumption boom. So that's the other channel to which the real economy was affected. There was a large consumption out of this housing wealth um, made possible through all these home equity lines of credit and so forth. Um, as well as a construction boom. Now, one uh, note of caution from our analysis is that even though you, know, you can write down a, a rational model that, that captures this, this rise and fall of, of house prices quantitatively, um, nothing in our analysis says that this relaxation of credit standards was a rational phenomenon in the first place. Right? So maybe uh, lenders and, and the financial system in general uh, were not um, acting rationally uh, in, in loosening these standards in the first place. Now, that's a difficult question um, to sort out. There's some research suggesting that um, you know, mortgage innovation was rational from lenders' perspective. Uh, maybe they just did the right thing for their own profits and, and footed the bill to the taxpayer. Um, but I think that's just a hard, a hard issue to sort out. So where do we stand today? Well, the same forces, the same leverage uh, cycle that I was describing that worked and uh, is now working in reverse in today's economy. So basically, this destruction of housing wealth um, is now basically limiting U.S. households' ability to spend. So consumption is basically uh, not, not looking very perky. Um, if history is a guide, this type of massive debt overhangs that the U.S. consumer is faced with uh, take many years to resolve. Uh, Reinhardt and Rogoff have an international historical study of these type of booms and busts, and they find that it takes typically you know, somewhere between five and ten years for these debt-to-GDP to, um, debt ratios, for example, to return to historical averages. So if, if history is a guide, this is going to be a painfully slow process. Now, of course, on the, on, the, on, the, on the residential investment side, there was a massive boom as well. We're now left with a, an overhang of, of, of empty houses, and construction has really totally fallen off a cliff. It's now only at a quarter of, of its boom level. Um, that itself, of course, creates a drag on employment because the construction industry was fueling a lot of the employment gains in, in, in the boom. Finally, the foreclosures that we talked about, they add a lot to the already high housing inventory for the press prices. Uh, and reduce collateral values. So this whole process is now going in reverse. Uh, we also mentioned the homeowners that were underwater. Um, one additional point I want to make about these homeowners is that at some macroeconomic level, what that, what, what, what that does is that it prevents people from reallocating. Often they're stuck in their house, their house is underwater, and they can't move to another labor market uh, where there might be a job for them. And so that's costing, uh, you, that's costing us in terms of welfare and, and output. Um, a final aspect of the, of the current situation is basically a gradual retrenchment of the government from mortgage markets and from ha um, housing markets in general. Uh, there, was, there was an unprecedented uh, fiscal and monetary uh, stimulus in 2009. Programs like the TELF, like the first-time um, house purchase credit, uh, a lot of these programs have meanwhile expired. Um, the other large program that is on its way out is, is, is the purchases of the Federal Reserve. Um, the purchases of, of agencies and mortgage-backed securities. Here is a little picture of, of, of these holdings. So th the blue line is agency and MBS purchases by the Fed. And that, that was basically a huge program that got implemented very quickly, uh, $1.25 trillion worth of purchases. And then in the summer of 2010, the Fed announced that it would gradually shift these purchases away from uh, agencies uh, towards treasuries as part of its uh, QE 
uh, quantitative easing too. One way I like to think about this, this quantitative easing or these, these mortgage purchases is that they work very similarly to these um, international purchases of U.S. agencies in the sense that they are also very price inelastic. When the Central Bank of China decides to buy our bonds, it doesn't worry too much about the yield. It's, do, it's making these purchases for other reasons, you know, exchange rate, stabilization, for example. And similarly, the Fed has other objectives than, than just to kind of maximize its gains on, on these positions. So these purchases have a similar effect of lowering the interest rate in the economy, um, which one might argue was a good thing during the um, crisis, but uh, might be a risk going forward. Now, as part of this unwind, mortgage interest rates have started to go back up uh, about 70 basis points already over the last uh, couple of months. And our uh, NYU colleague, Nouriel Rubini, has warned that this could uh, cause a double dip in housing markets. Um, you know, what I was arguing before is that maybe the effect on house prices will not be as large as, um, as one might fear uh, because of these offsetting in, um, risk premia effects. So basically, this, the current environment is one of weakness in, 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 in consumption and in, uh, and in investment, especially in residential investment. Um, but nevertheless, that shouldn't prevent us from, or that shouldn't prevent policymakers from tackling the structural issues that are, that are really long-term in nature um, because the mortgage market is such a large part of the U.S. economy, GSC reform is really macroeconomic policy uh, and should be really contemplated, it should be really seen as such. So let me just uh, finish by setting the stage a little bit for uh, what housing policy beyond the GSCs uh, could look like. Uh, by, you know, and, and, and again, following up on some of the discussions we had this morning, by looking briefly across uh, the world, and we do this in our Guarantee to Fail book uh, as well, and very quickly, you come to the conclusion that no other country has the extent of government support for home ownership in the U.S., and uh, no other country has such large GSCs with large investment functions. Canada has a GSC, but it doesn't have a large portfolio, for example. Yet the U.S. is pretty, uh, pretty mediocre in terms of housing outcomes. Now, another point is that the government intervention didn't really help prevent the boom and the bust in house prices. In fact, we argue that the, the mere the fact that the government was involved in, in, in the GSEs led to a race to the bottom and in some sense cost uh, the, the um, kind of the lending down the credit chain, down the credit quality chain. And finally, another thing that sets the U.S. apart is the fact that it has such deep securitization markets, but this securitization didn't really live up to its promise, which was to diffuse the risk across the U.S. economy. Instead, securitization didn't work because banks didn't pass on uh, the trenches that they, were, that they were securitizing. In fact, they were holding them themselves to a large extent. And it's that fact that basically uh, didn't really help us cushion the blow either. Um, finally, a, a, another big difference between the U.S. and other countries is that it seems to me that housing policies in, in for example, Western European countries are a lot more focused on rental assistance as opposed to ownership. So I see uh, four different... Um, aspects of housing policy reform. I think the first one is to just generally reduce the distortions that are induced by the government. Uh, these distortions fundamentally just affect the relative price of housing consumption and of housing investment. They make housing too cheap. So what do people do? They just buy more houses. As uh, my co-author co Larry uh, White was pointing out, the, house, the average house has increased 50% in size in the U.S. since the mid-70s. The relative price of residential investment is also too high. That means people are constructing too much housing, and we know that housing investments are not particularly productive compared to, let's say, um, property and plant, um, uh, plant investments in plants or in human capital. So basically, we're missing out on growth here, and, and reform should reorient us towards uh, higher growth policies. Second, uh, we should, I think, reduce our focus on home ownership as a policy tool and shift more towards uh, stimulating rental housing. Um, the current policy makes no distinction between large and small homes, first or second homes, and leverage, and it subsidizes leverage. So, you know, as I pointed out, that led the U.S. consumer not to acquire more home equity, but in fact, just to be more leveraged. U.S. home ownership policies are also, unfortunately, very regressive. So the, the reason I think that everybody was able to agree on, on perpetuating these policies and, and just passing them on from one presidential administration to the next is that the left and the right could agree on, on the home ownership society, but research has shown that these policies really benefit the wealthy, and, and you know, if anything, they're regressive instead of um, progressive. So m we know that middle incomes haven't really risen in real terms since the mid-1970s, um, and in fact, you know, 
wealth income inequality is now at, at, at an all-time high, and all-time post-war high, and maybe it's as high as in the 1920s. And so I think if um, there's, there's possibly a much better, if indeed it's policy goal to, to curb that income inequality from further rising, there's much better ways of doing that than through uh, stimulating home ownership. Okay, so to conclude, um, the last couple of points are to, I think it's gonna be important, any reform, whether it's a, a private or a, or a public or a private-public partnership solution, is fundamentally gonna to have to reduce the leverage on the asset side. So it's gonna to have to shift credit risk uh, I think exposure back towards the household. What I mean by that is that you know maybe we cannot sustain larger than 80% loan-to-value ratios. Uh, we're going to need better documentation and so forth. I think the crisis has shown us that the banking sector is ill-equipped to bear this aggregate amount of um, of housing risk. Um, and in fact, maybe the, the household sector is going to have to need is going to have to bear more of uh, more of that going forward. Finally, it's important for reform to stimulate competitive mortgage markets so that we can have a level playing field between all the different entities. Right now, we had distortions on the GSC side. We had distortions on the large, uh, uh, large complex financial institutions, and that created all kinds of tensions and this race to the bottom. Uh, I think we're going to need to, to um, eliminate those, those distortions and just allow the, the product markets to develop whatever array of products that uh, make economic sense and uh, that the U.S. consumer demands. Uh, thanks very much to the organizers for inviting me to speak on this topic. It's a topic I've worked on extensively both as an academic and now as an assistant director at CBO. And um, this talk is a bit of a mix of the two perspectives. Um, so as we've talked about um, all day, um, right now the government is the mortgage market with about 90% of mortgages. And um, so obviously how the government thinks about the cost of federal guarantees is going to be very important for how reform works out going forward. But in particular, um, for the longest time, of course, Fannie and Freddie only had an implicit guarantee, and that was thought to be one of the reasons that um, they were able to get away with taking so much risk in the first place. Um, so I think um, a theme that's come through very much today is that it's very important to get risk-based pricing back into the mortgage equation. Um, and so pricing federal guarantees is a very big part of that. So um, I guess um, we can all agree that setting risk-based prices is extremely important. Um, but when you get into the nitty gritty of that, there's actually quite different views when you talk to different groups. Um, so policymakers, practitioners, and academics uh, might have um, quite a different view of of how to get there. Um, so, so sort of from a policy perspective, oftentimes if you say, you know, what, how does a government program break even? Um, well, when you have a, a guarantee program, the basic break even idea is if, say, the guarantee fees you collect just match the outflows from the program, you've broken it you've broken even. So you basically just have to recover your expected losses. So that's one con so one concept of risk-based pricing is you just have to charge enough to break even. Um, well, that view of what it means to charge for risk is quite different than what the capital markets require because they don't just require a return for the average loss they need compensation for the risk they're taking. So there's this concept of systematic risk or market risk, which reflects that investors say, well, when do we see a lot of defaults? We see a lot of defaults when the economy is doing poorly when we're in a recession, and so we need a higher rate of return to compensate us for the fact that these losses are occurring exactly at the time when they're most costly. So this idea that systematic risk is a cost is very much part of any kind of a market pricing idea of guarantee cost, but it's not something that necessarily naturally shows up in a government context. Um, so um, <laughs> so there, we could have a long philosophical discussion about how things should be, but there, there, sometimes people bring up the point, well, the government doesn't really need to make a profit, and all these higher returns in the private sector are really just a profit. They're not somehow essential. Um, I think um, there's an argument to be made that, in fact, those costs of market risk do pertain to the government in the sense that when the government 
takes on activities that are risky in the sense of the private sector taking on risk, those risks are ultimately being absorbed by taxpayers. And so it's not really a profit in that risk premium, but rather a compensation to the taxpayers who are ultimately bearing the burden of those guarantees. Um, anyway, be that as it may, in a policy context, and this is something that James Lockhart alluded to, um, it can be even hard to get to that first level of risk pricing, which is to simply price to cover your expected losses. Um, part of that is when you think about these credit guarantees, most of the time they have no cost at all. In fact, they make money because they earn the guarantee fee, but it's only in events like we just saw that something goes wrong. So if you're sort of looking at recent historical data, you tend to underprice those guarantees, thinking, well, there really isn't that much risk um, there. And even when the risk is recognized, there isn't always the capacity in government um, to try to price it correctly. Okay, so um, a natural place to look if you'd like to have a more market-based view of the cost to the government is in fact how practitioners themselves view their cost of capital. Um, and so um, this slide is a little bit complicated, but um, let me try to use it to make what I think is a very useful point. And this again gets back to something that James Lockhart was trying to emphasize, which is if you talk to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, about how they view their own cost of capital, um, like any business, they say, well, you know, the cost of capital reflects what we have to pay our debt holders and our equity holders. And what we have to pay them, in turn, depends on the risk of our assets, our mortgages, and then there's also the off-balance sheet guarantees and fee income. Okay, so when, when the GSEs look at their own cost of capital, this is sort of what they look at. And they also feel that rightly, looking at their own, their own situation, that the more equity that they have to hold, the higher the cost of capital is going to be. And um, basically, the price of their debt is pretty insensitive to the risk of their assets. They, they pay something close to the risk-free rate, but the more equity they hold, um, the more they're paying this higher equity weight, so their cost of capital goes up. So they sort of resist holding more equity. So what's missing from all this equation is, of course, that um, what we don't see on their balance sheet is the value of the federal guarantee. And where that belongs is on the asset side. So what the GSEs benefit from and what lowers their cost of capital is this government guarantee. Now, part of the reason I'm um, going through all this length on this slide is because in terms of valuing a government guarantee, sort of technically, what you want to do is look at market prices and infer from those market prices what the cost is to the government. And I guess this is meant to be sort of a reminder that in some sense, the market gets to ignore the very riskiest thing to price, that government guarantee, because they're getting it for free and they don't have to price it. So it's indirectly lowering their cost of capital. So it's sort of, one has to sort of infer from all of this value of the government guarantee. Um, so to do that, what's actually very useful is to take an approach that practitioners in the private market would take to value credit guarantees or that academics would take. So when I say a theory-based approach, I mean sort of good theory, um, not theory theory. Um, so in that, in that sense, um, these guarantees are like put options, and you can use options pricing theory or derivatives-based pricing theories to try to get a handle on that. Um, so what you, what you figure out immediately, which is sort of a great insight from looking at it this way, is that these guarantees are really the place where risk is concentrated, in particular where this market risk is concentrated, and that makes those guarantees extremely expensive, even though they're only called on very infrequently, the sort of the price of the risk implicit in those guarantees is quite high. Okay, um, so, so why does this matter in uh, wearing my hat as working at the Congressional Budget Office? Well. Um, I guess you can think of prices as they appear in the budget as being the currency of policy. So basically at CBO, we're building an apparatus which is designed to give solid estimates of what the costs are of various alternative policies for the GSEs going forward. Okay. And so the principles that are used to create those costs really matter. Um, as it turns out, what CBO does now is in fact an evaluation of GSE costs using full risk adjustment, using market prices. Um, 
So, so that's where I'm right now. But in any case, um, the reason that I think it's going to be useful to the policy debate that CBO does use market prices is, for instance, if you think about a policy option which is contemplating the government taking their current MBS holdings and selling them into the private market at market prices. Okay, so if the GSEs now just take those securities and sell them to the market, the question is, as a first approximation, is the government better off or worse off? Well, I think most people would agree with me that that's a fairly neutral transaction. That is, if the government continues to hold the security, they get the value in that security, whereas if they sell the security, they collect the cash, which is its price. So that should be neutral. Um, it's only if you evaluate the GSEs on something approximating a market price that you get that neutrality. There's other budget conventions where you wouldn't get that neutrality. So, um, so how you value these guarantees does matter for how you would view it. For instance, if, if you went back to the view I described earlier where policymakers believe there shouldn't be a charge for risk, under that view, the MBS securities are worth more to the government than they are to the private sector because the government treats them as having a return above the treasury rate, whereas the private sector would demand a higher return. So um, this is just to say that this, this um, market pricing approach does give you a level playing field in the budget process. Okay, so um, a little bit of a, um, now I'm gonna go a little bit to um, a slightly more technical discussion, which is based on two papers I've written in the past with Bob McDonald, which really tried to get into, well, how do you develop a methodology to properly price these GSE guarantees? And I'm just gonna tell you the general conclusions of the analysis and show you some numbers. Okay, so I think the first important insight of this kind of analysis, and I think it's very intuitive actually, is that when you try to infer the government guarantee cost from private equity value, so for instance, from the stock prices of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, um, you have to be careful because those stock prices actually include the value of the government guarantee as I showed you on Fannie and Freddie's balance sheet before. That is to say, if you take the government's stock holdings and you try to evaluate them directly at market prices, you're overestimating their value. Why is that? Because those market prices incorporate the value of the government guarantee, but the government is giving that guarantee, so the government doesn't get the value of the own guarantee it's giving. So you start out with the observation that stock prices are upwardly biased when it pertains to the government. And this is interesting not just for the GSEs, by the way, but also for instance the government's holding of AIG. Okay, so it was another place where we were sort of trying to get a handle on what the government was doing. Okay, um, but the good news for these options pricing methods is at least under certain assumptions, you can basically use the same basic approach because you can argue that the volatility of the private company equity isn't gonna be that different with or without the federal guarantee. Um, so we can go ahead and use what's called a Merton or a KMV approach to do the asset pricing. Um, just one last, I guess this last observation isn't that important, but in the literature there's sort of a debate about how big the subsidy cost was. Um, a different methodology is based on looking at bond spreads rather than options pricing models. Um, our work shows that those bond spread estimates are probably a little bit upwardly biased in terms of the government's cost. Okay, anyway, let's just look at some, um, so these are, these numbers um, show you estimates of the cost of Fannie and Freddie as of their position of 2005, where not too many were not too many people were very worried about credit risk. And um, I just want to uh, point out a few rows of this table. I guess the bottom line is that according to our estimates, if the government had charged for the implicit guarantee a fair price, given the conditions of 2005, would have been somewhere between 20 and 30 basis points. Okay, so that was sort of the fair value. If they had charged that, that would have reflected the risk that was there, even under the very benign conditions of 2005. Um, I guess something else I'd like to show you is if you look down to the second from the bottom row called default probability, um, over 10 years, it looked like the default probability was about 5% over 20 years, maybe six, seven, eight percent. Okay, so those were sort of the actual default probabilities that our estimates suggested over that 
horizon of 10 or 20 years. Um, the line above that is called a risk-neutral probability. Um, that's always a term that is very confusing if, to practitioners as well as non-practitioners, but you can think of it as reflecting the probability of default and also the market price of risk in that default. And you can see that that's many multiples of the actual default probability. And it's sort of a measure of how much of a risk premium there needs to be in these guarantees to make them fairly priced. Um, just one more thing, you might think the 20, 30 basis points is really small compared to the risk that was in the GSEs. So in this last table, um, what we considered was, well, what if Fannie Mae's assets had been 5% less in value or 10% less in value? And you can see that in that case, if the assets go down to 10% less in value, the fair premium rate actually goes up to 81 basis points. So I think one advantage of this sort of risk-based approach to setting guarantee fees even for the government is that it does provide feedback in terms of the risk taking. The more levered they are, the higher the guarantee fee. Okay, so um, that's basically it. Thank you very much. So I've been uh, keeping tabs on what uh, the moderator from the previous panel, John Gaffer, said when uh, he alleged Susan Walker was on time. Um, because of her gender, and Dwight Jaffe and Matt Richardson were not because of her gender. Uh, Debbie is like keeping up the pattern, um, and and I'm going to say that there's another factor that's important here, which is the Wharton factor, which is the one thing Susan Walker and I have in common, which is that you know, we are going to be on time. Um, you know, Business Week might have given us a C as a grade for our teaching, but it would have given us an A for punctuality. Okay, so. Um, I'm here, I was asked to talk about tax expenditures for housing, so I'm like the one person who's not going to talk about GSEs at all. Um, and so, so tax expenditures don't have a lot to do with GSEs. Um, they have some stuff to do with the economy. They have an awful lot to do with housing. Um, and it's one of those policy things that's interesting because, you know, any time that we need some money and you need to cut something, you know, sort of maybe like the next best thing to, to waste, fraud, and abuse is the housing tax expenditure, um, which it's not quite waste, fraud, and abuse, but maybe is close in economists' mind to, to, to waste, fraud, and abuse, and it's a lot of money. So the uh, numbers I have up here from the Joint Committee on Taxation, um, the ones that they gave, put out at the end of, of December of 2010, so these are their estimates for, for 2011, and so the estimates of the mortgage interest deduction, which is, again, if you itemize on your tax return, you get to deduct uh, uh, the interest on your mortgage from your taxable income, uh, as long as the loan amount in aggregate is less than a million dollars on your first and second homes. Um, uh, that was about $94 billion. And the property tax deduction, so again, if you itemize on your tax return, you can deduct property taxes from your taxable income, uh, about $23 billion. And the capital gains tax exclusion, which is you do not have to pay tax on $250,000 of the first $250,000 of capital gains on your house if you're single, $500,000 if you're married. Uh, uh, this used to be a really interesting thing when people had capital gains on their houses. Um, it's about $16.5 billion. So that's a lot of money. And the, the, the guys at the Joint Committee Taxation hate when I do this because you are really not supposed to add these together because they're all one-off things and they, they interplay in a way that doesn't give you a number this big, but I'm going to ignore them and add it together. It's $133 billion, um, uh, which is a lot of money um, on a deficit of just you know about $1.1 trillion projected in 2011. This is about 13% of the deficit. And you start looking at it and saying this would be a nice thing to take away. Uh, and certainly policies that we have seen are in the context of, well, why don't we get rid of that? Um, so I'm going to talk later about what happens when we get rid of it, um, but we're going to start with, with you know, who uh, actually, oh, it's one more thing, um, but who's going to benefit from it while it's there? So uh, I should uh, note now, um, because it's going to be important in just a bit, that uh, that tax expenditure for mortgage interest and the property taxes and not taxing capital gains, it's only one component of the overall subsidy in the tax code to the owner-occupied housing. Namely, uh, we do not tax in the U.S. Uh, the fact that uh, you get a return on the equity that you invest in the house. We just don't measure. It doesn't show up as cash income, so we don't tax it. Okay. So, for example, if I bought a house and I financed it 100% with debt, assuming it was a sufficiently small house or a sufficiently inexpensive house, um, I would be able to deduct all that interest on that debt. If I instead put equity in that house, I use no debt whatsoever, I just pay cash for it, okay, uh, that cash I put in would have earned a taxable return somewhere else. 
right? So I'm giving up a taxable return, and so the government is giving up revenue when I put that money in to invest my house, okay? So this is a subsidy that is there, and because, as, as, as Sten pointed out, for most of history, we actually had relatively low leverage rates in the U.S., uh, that is the bulk of the subsidy to owner-occupied housing, namely that we are not going to, you know, I get to use essentially after-tax dollars uh, uh, to, to invest in my house. Okay, so, so some estimates from 2003, which I'm using because uh, we don't have 2010 data yet, and the 2007 data that we do have is too boom-like, right? And we're back really into the 2003 housing market, so history has become relevant again. So I have some 2003 numbers. Uh, mortgage interest deduction about 72 billion, property tax deduction about 24 billion. I didn't estimate the value of the capital gains tax exclusion, but about $230 billion uh, on the untaxed return on housing equity. I'm going to drop this for a second now because there is no reasonable policy proposal out there to start taxing uh, the, the imputed rent on housing in the United States, okay? Um, but this can be important when we think about what people are going to do uh, uh, if, uh, uh, you know, what they do in the presence of the mortgage tax deduction. Okay, so who benefits from this mortgage interest deduction? Okay. Basically, uh, it's a very regressive uh, uh, policy, and the benefit's not uniformly distributed uh, uh, across the population or even across the country. So the high benefit is high-income households, younger households, low benefit or low-income households, and seniors. And the reason is that uh, high-income households first spend a lot more on housing, so they have more dollars to be subsidized. Second, they tend to have high marginal tax rates. And so when the dollar of mortgage interest saves you your marginal tax rate times that dollar, then they have a large subsidy per dollar of mortgage interest that they have. Uh, they also, uh, uh, the young, tend to have more debt. So the average loan to value uh, in uh, 2004 uh, in the survey consumer finances for young households was about 70%. In the other column, for seniors, uh, only 20% of, of uh, people age 70 or older have any debt whatsoever, and the average leverage is about 12%, okay? So they don't have any mortgage interest to be subsidized. Uh, in low-income households, even though they borrow to buy their houses, uh, they don't tend to itemize on your tax returns. If you don't itemize on your tax returns, you do not get a mortgage interest subsidy. So uh, uh, what does this look like uh, in terms of dollars? Well, you actually get some considerable dollars of subsidy on a per household basis. And the way to read this table is that the, each row is a different age bracket, and it's totaled at the bottom, and each column is a different income bracket, people making less than $40,000, 40 to 75,000, 75 to 125,000, et cetera. And so what you see is that the top right is a heavily subsidized uh, section. Those are young households, they have lots of debt, okay? and they have uh, a rather expensive houses because they expect to be fairly well compensated throughout their lives, um, and they have high marginal tax rates, and so they're getting about $7,700 per household uh, from, this, from this, uh, the mortgage interest deduction. Right? Uh, by contrast, older households over the age of 65 making less than $40,000 a year are getting $21. Um, so there is a huge disparity uh, across the income and age distribution and how much people, people are, are, are receiving from the subsidy. Okay? So people making where you would peg the, the uh, average person in the US uh, in the 75 to 125,000 bracket, about $1,300 in subsidy. Uh, and then if you look at people age 50 to 65, on the rightmost column, it's about $1,200 per year in subsidy okay, that they are effectively getting from the mortgage interest deduction. Right? So that's the landscape of what the mortgage interest deduction uh, does. Uh, what does it do for the economy? Well, the first thing that it does, of course, is it lowers out-of-pocket costs for existing homeowners. Right? So you have a house, and you are getting a lower tax bill because you have a mortgage. Um, and so the implication of that, of course, is that if you eliminate the mortgage interest deduction, the first thing it does is it reduces disposable income for people who already have houses because their mortgage hasn't changed and their deduction has gone away. Okay? So whether you cap it or eliminate it or whatever, uh, it has fairly severe consequences for disposable income and therefore for consumption, and it doesn't really help you in a downturn to be reducing people's income. And so this is why you almost always see tax reform proposals bundle changing the mortgage interest deduction with some other tax change that gives income back to people. Okay? So they are effectively left income unchanged. Okay? The thing that the, 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 the mortgage interest deduction does besides reducing housing costs is it encourages housing spending, okay? Because it not only changes the income of people, not only gives them a lower tax bill, it changes the relative price of housing. It reduces the relative price of housing, right? Uh, and the existing 
uh, mortgage interest reduction, reduces the relative cost of housing by about 6% relative to what it would be if there were no mortgage interest reduction. Right? So people spend more on things that are subsidized. Uh, they go on sale, you buy more of it. That's the whole point. And so it may, leads people to spend more on housing. It comes in two channels. One, people have already mentioned here, people buy larger houses. Uh, the other thing they do is buy more expensive houses, which means houses in more expensive locations, right? Or they bid up the housing prices. Right? Uh, how much more? Well, that depends. There's a range in estimates in literature, sort of three to six percent more. That 6% average is misleading. Right? The first thing you would take away from it is that you eliminate the mortgage interest deduction, you get a 6% decline in house prices, 3 to 6% decline in house prices on average across the US. But again, this is not something that is uniform. Right? Uh, young, low-income households, 5% uh, uh, is the amount of their, their uh, effective subsidy. Um, but if you look at young, high-income households, it's 20%. Right? So it's a fairly large subsidy uh, or a fairly large incentive to spend on housing for subsets of the population. For older households, it doesn't matter what your income is. They effectively have no debt. The mortgage interest deduction is about 1% uh, decrease in the relative price of housing. So what does that do? Um, well, I'll show you that in a second. Um, but the other thing to mention um, is that the mortgage interest deduction, as it's constituted, leads to a neutral treatment of debt and equity finance of housing, okay? We have been conditioned to think of the mortgage interest deduction as encouraging households to finance their houses with debt. That's not quite right. What it does is it fails to discourage households from financing their houses with debt because whether or not they itemize, everyone effectively gets a subsidy for putting a dollar of equity into their house. And what the mortgage interest deduction is this makes that neutral. So it is still a fair policy question that maybe we really don't want it to be neutral. Maybe we want the tax code to discourage debt investment into housing. Um, maybe we think we have too much debt investment in the US. Um, but it currently makes it neutral. So what that does, though, uh, uh, as an as a important um, um, effect, um, is it means that if you eliminate the mortgage interest deduction, then households will be more reluctant to use debt uh, and much more inclined to use equity invest in their houses, and the loan-to-value ratio will go down. So uh, how much could people do that, um, again, depends. Right? So this table basically shows you how much debt households could, you, could, could eliminate, how much mortgage debt households could pay down just by transferring assets on their existing balance sheets to pay down their mortgages. Right? What would households do if we no longer have a, a tax-favored mortgage? Well, they will use their tax-favored equity to replace the debt. Right? It turns out in the US, households with lots of assets don't have much mortgage debt. And households with lots of mortgage debt don't have very many assets. So households' scope to do this is actually remarkably limited. Uh, and it sort of depends on what assets you think uh, are going to be implied. Um, if you look at high income households, right, they have lots of assets. That's a 250K column there. Uh, once you get beyond the 25 to 35 year olds, they have relatively little debt and they can actually use their assets to pay pretty much off uh, all of their mortgage. Okay? So what happens if you eliminate the mortgage interest deduction? Those guys uh, uh, basically are unaffected. They're just going to substitute tax-favored equity for their tax-favored debt, because debt's not tax-favored anymore. Uh, Low-income households have very little scope to actually undo an elimination of the mortgage interest deduction, because they don't have assets to pay down their mortgages, right? and so they can't get at it. Uh, the elderly, the seniors, greater than 65, they actually just don't have very much debt. They also don't have very many assets, but they have enough assets to pay down a lot of their debt. And again, you would think that what, that is what they would do. So on average, what we find out at the bottom right is about 30% of mortgage debt can be paid off in the US by using a relatively trivial amount of assets uh, to just reshuffle on households' balance sheets if the mortgage interest deduction were eliminated. Um, and so that's in part what's going on. So, so households have more assets on their balance sheet because they're also having mortgage debt because debt's tax favored uh, in the current system. Um, in that lower right column, if corner would be 19% if we said that households you know, left checking and saving and money market accounts out of the equation, and it goes up to 55% if you let them sell their cars and boats and stuff to actually pay it off. So it really depends on what assets you think are in play. Here, this example just has, has financial assets. The last thing I want to do um, 
is, is uh, talk quickly uh, about, about the last thing that the mortgage interest deduction does, um, which is it, it supports house prices. Um, the housing subsidy uh, uh, inc you know, increases households' willingness to pay because their cost per dollar of housing spending is lower. Um, and what effect that has uh, varies across the U.S. So the, the highest subsidy is in places that have high incomes and high house prices. Right? High house prices means there's more dollars to be subsidized. High income means the rate of subsidization is higher because the marginal tax rate is higher. And households are more likely to itemize. Um, and also, uh, in, into what you see in the U.S., if you look across the U.S., it's that it turns out that high income people tend to live together in places with high house prices. And so the benefits of the subsidy are geographically concentrated. This doesn't matter much in most contexts when we think about income tax policy because we care about where the effects of that policy affect along the income distribution. When we start talking about housing, where houses matter because they're in a location, right? uh, tax policies that have effect on varying locations are what comes out of, out of, out of uh, this particular system. Right? So the very places that have the high incomes and high house prices also are ones in which the subsidy most affects house prices, and it's also where the houses, uh, uh, the, the subsidy is the largest. And that basically is California and the Northeast Corridor. So um, uh, this is just the distribution of housing tax subsidy across states. So I'm going to show you this from 1990. I'm going to show you some other numbers from 2000. Uh, and I'm <laughs> going to read it to you because you can't read the bottom. Uh, the, 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 the columns, it's the, the, the subsidy per household. Right? And I'm going to read from the tallest column all the way back towards me, okay? And so the very one at the end is Hawaii. Next to that is the District of Columbia. Then California, Connecticut, New York, Massachusetts, New Jersey, Rhode Island, Maryland, New Hampshire, and Virginia. Um, everyone else is pretty much into the sort of the great unwashed of having very little benefit or having very low cost but not really carrying a whole bunch. Okay. So my particular view about why proposals repeatedly say, well, let's eliminate the mortgage interest deduction and then repeatedly fail to do it, has to do with how big those few bars on the right there in sort of the, the, the most uh, politically uh, connected states. Um, you can do the same thing uh, in metropolitan areas. This actually is 2000 data. Uh, and again, I will read who the big beneficiaries are from the mortgage interest deduction. Uh, San Francisco, San Jose, uh, Connecticut, Santa Barbara, uh, Suffolk and Nassau County in New York, Oakland, California, New York, uh, uh, Santa Ana, Anaheim, Irvine, uh, Honolulu, Hawaii. Okay, you get the idea. Then we get to like Cambridge and Los Angeles towards the bottom. And Bethesda and Boston are on there as well. Okay, so so again, just to basically the 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 big cities in the Northeast and in California uh, get the big benefits because high income people live there, house prices are high, they get very large subsidies. That means if you eliminate the mortgage interest deduction, that 20% is really happening in these places, okay? So, so that 6%, to which is like three to 6% in terms of support for house prices from the mortgage interest deduction is the national average. Most of the country gets very little cost or benefit from this policy, but in a handful of, of, of major cities along the coast, this is a really, really big deal. Okay, so I, I blew my Wharton theory because I am over time. Um, so I should not have started. If you, if you net the joke out of the talk, am I close? The, the, uh, um, okay, so, so let, me, let me just uh, finish by, by saying, um, uh, uh, just, just a couple of things, because because we, we do repeatedly um, uh, talk about eliminating the mortgage interest deduction, including just very recently in the tax reform uh, uh, commission. Um, uh, it, the housing tax expenditure is ex expensive, um, and is you know, it is very hard to make a coherent argument in favor of it, right? Because what it does basically is encourages people to spend more on housing, okay, but doesn't really do a very good job of getting more people to be homeowners. Okay? And so unless you think we should be a world in which people have ever more bathrooms or live in ever more expensive places, um, is that capital probably can be put to better use. Um, so, so, but it's difficult to rein in once it's there uh, without an offsetting policy. Right? It would lower house prices, which suggests that you don't want to eliminate the mortgage interest deduction in a period when we're on the brink of, of you know, foreclosures. Um, because you don't want things that are going to tip you over, right? This is the policy that you want to eliminate when house prices are rising, and that's the very point where it's politically difficult to eliminate. Um, but when you do it, uh, you want to phase the changes in, you need to get around the political uh, uh, dilemma of the benefits of being very concentrated while the cost of this policy being very uh, uh, 
uh, spread out. A lot of uh, uh, groups that are intensively uh, uh, care about maintaining this deduction. Um, and I, I, should, I should finish that uh, one thing that's very important. Uh, again, this is a, not only changing the relative price of housing, it is an income transfer policy. And any time we see a reform of this, we do recognize that uh, when you change the mortgage interest deduction, you need to counterbalance the effects of, of undoing this regressive policy um, with some other change in the, in, in the tax code. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks uh, to the organizers for having me. I'm the last on the panelists, so thank you to all in the audience for uh, bearing with us this far. Um, as you can see from the title, I'm going to be talking about mortgage finance, uh, unsurprisingly. But I'm going to take a different angle on this uh, question. So far, we have focused um, a lot on the GSEs. I'm going to take a broader view on the consequences of mortgage finance, both historically uh, and internationally, but also in terms of the connections of uh, mortgage financing to the real economy. And when I say real economy, think of consumption, investment, employment, uh, the stuff that we eat and the people who work. Uh, so let me motivate the talk by giving you a longer time horizon to a, of a graph that you've already seen uh, Stein present. This is the US household debt to GDP ratio from 1916 onwards, so roughly about 100 years uh, of time span. The data sources are different, that's why the two lines don't overlap each other perfectly. But the point, uh, you can see very clearly uh, the, the twin peaks in this graph. Uh, and they show you that there are uh, two points in time when household debt to GDP kind of touches or crosses 100%. And one is 1929, and the other one is around 2007. And uh, we all know what happened uh, afterwards. In, in, those, in those two occasions. So the first uh, question that I want you to think about is, and I'll be talking more about it, is is this just a coincidence, this uh, overlapping of the leverage uh, highs and the follow, following deep recessions? Um, it's possible that those were just two data points at the end of the day, so maybe this was just some, a couple of unlucky events that happened at those time periods. Um, the other reason to be a little bit suspicious of that graph that I showed you is the following, which is leverage at the end of the day is a statement about the gross borrowing position of the economy. And we know that for every borrower, there is a corresponding lender as well. So when we say leverage is high uh, or leverage is low, what we are really talking about is that in reaction to a given shock, uh, things are going to be redistributed in the economy differently, in particular, if a downturn comes, then the borrowers who are levered up are going to uh, suffer um, uh, a, a larger hit as their equity gets wiped out and they uh, owe uh, more than what they have uh, at that time period. So really leverage uh, to a first order approximation is really a question of how shocks are distributed uh, within an economy between lenders and, and, and borrowers. So I want you to keep that thought in mind as we think about the connection between leverage and the real economy. Okay, so now thinking about whether this relationship between leverage and the real economy is just a coincidence, uh, I'm going to show you some evidence that suggests that it's a stronger relationship than what I just shown you. Uh, it holds elsewhere in the world as well, and it also shows uh, more strongly when we look at within the U.S. more carefully. So let me show you some of that evidence. First of all, and this graph comes from Glick and Lansing at the San Francisco Fed. Um, it's sort of analogous to the graph that I showed you for the US, but instead of taking a long-term historical view, it takes a cross-country view and focuses on the current uh, recession. And what you have on the um, x-axis is the percentage uh, change in household leverage in the preceding uh, 10 years before the uh, recession in different OECD countries. And on the y-axis, you have the drop in consumption, which is the main component of GDP. And you can see a very strong relationship once again, which is to say countries that levered up the most are the ones that have seen the largest declines in consumption and their GDPs as well. And again, this is a bit surprising because, as I said, leverage, after all, is just a question of 
uh, who gets the shock, and for every loser, there is a corresponding winner as well, because every borrower has a lender attached to him or her. Um, this, there's an uh, earlier paper by Mervyn King, who's now the governor of uh, the central bank in England. Uh, he makes the same point using data from earlier recessions. Um, and I'm going to show you a similar pattern holding within the US when we look more carefully across counties and breaking up those counties by the run-up in household leverage. So let me show you that data, and then by that time, hopefully, I have convinced you at least of this strong statistical relationship between household leverage and the real economy. Um, by the way, I've been using the term household leverage. It should be obvious that predominantly household leverage is driven by mortgage uh, financing, either through first-time uh, uh, home buyers or through refinancings and home equity and so on. Uh, so what is this graph doing? This graph is showing you um, the evolution over time in durable consumption as measured by auto, uh, new auto purchases uh, in the US. And the US in this graph is broken down into two categories. The blue line are counties within the US that uh, lie in the top decile of uh, the, the, the increase in household leverage uh, during the 2000s. And the red line is the, the uh, I think I said it the other way around. The red line is the top decile, so they, those are the most levered counties, and the blue line are the least levered counties. And what you can see in this pattern is that before 2006, the two are kind of following each other closely, but towards the end of 2006, and this is when, since everyone here understands housing, we know uh, there's a slowdown in the housing uh, market towards the end of 2006, you start to see uh, a divergence in the, uh, in the consumption of durable goods as proxied by auto purchases between high lev highly levered and less levered uh, households across the US. In particular, there is a sharp slowdown in durable consumption um, in the high levered counties. And for those who study macro uh, um, uh, economies in more detail, they know that the component of GDP that responds the earliest and is the most dominant GDP in terms of understanding fluctuations is durable consumption. So you can see durable consumption in high levered households that is uh, being cut back the earliest and in a rather sharp manner. Uh, the shaded area is the NBR recession period, and you can see everyone kind of dips down during that uh, recession, and particularly during the so-called Lehman crisis. But look at the rebound that uh, is also instructive in this graph. The rebound is much stronger among households or counties that were not as levered to begin with. Um, the high levered counties do not see much of a rebound. You, they just, it, 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 it arrests their fall, but then they don't rebound as much as the less uh, levered households do. So I think the, what I want you to take away from this is, again, this very strong relationship between leverage and the real economy, not just across, not just over time within the US, not just across countries in uh, the developed economies, but also within the US when we compare um, um, uh, ha households that levered up and households that did not um, uh, lever as much. One thing I, as you stare at this graph, uh, one other thing I want to point out is that the drop happens much before any uh, uh, of those breakdowns of the financial system occur. So there is something happening much before that that is forcing those households to start to pull back on their consumption. And one obvious uh, 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 factor there is that as housing market slows down, they are seeing their wealth erode or maybe their expectations, they're realigning their expectations in terms of how what the value of their net assets truly is, and so they're cutting back on durable consumptions uh, immediately. You see the same picture when you look at local employment. Um, uh, a, a significant fraction of consumption is based on local output, and so you can see the impact on employment as well, another real variable, and again, very similar story to the one I just told you uh, about durable consumption that also holds true with the pattern in, in local employment as well. Okay. So now that we have this strong link between mortgage uh, financing and the real economy, in particular the problem of over leverage of, of households, uh, what can be done about this particular situation? When usually we talk about leverage not just in the context of uh, household leverage, but also in the context of uh, financial leverage more broadly, 
uh, people talk about credit cycles and what can be done to mute or, under, or, or monitor credit cycles in a, in a more effective manner. Uh, there are different questions that are raised in that light, and one can ask the same questions here as well. One is, can we monitor or regulate household leverage any better? Another uh, related question is, um, if we do try to monitor or regulate household leverage, well, how are we going to uh, uh, measure it? In, in other words, who is going to decide when we have reached a tipping point that we should cut back from? And even if we know where, that we have reached that point, who is going to pull the trigger and announce that the party is over? Those are all similar uh, and familiar questions that we have grappled with elsewhere. And I think the answer to these questions uh, based on past experience is rather disappointing. Uh, we should not aim too high uh, when thinking about these questions and are, are hoping that we can solve the, them just by measuring things better or just by having a more smarter regulator, as was pointed out earlier, or a, or a regulator with more data or with a better supercomputer and things of that sort. I think the political constraints are more binding than any technological constraints or IQ constraints. Um, so let me just propose, and this is maybe a little bit um, uh, more speculative, but I think one way of thinking about the problem of leverage and how to deal with this, it is, it's one way to think about this problem uh, is the following, that it's really a problem of uh, inefficient risk sharing exposed. Given a shock, so okay, we are going to lever up. If it's not going to be the GSEs, by the way, a lot of us talked about the GSEs. I do totally believe that GSEs need reform. But we have also seen occasions where it's just the private market over leveraging the household sector, for example. So I think just because uh, we don't have GSEs does not imply necessarily that we are not going to get back into the same sorts of problems in the future. So I think while it helps on other dimensions, it's not necessarily a solution to this. I think we still need to think about possibilities going forward that at some point, maybe 20 years down the road, the household sector levers up for, for whatever reason, what do we do at that point in time, even if it's levered up based on a private uh, 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 financial system? The main question and then is going to be when push comes to shove, so it's not Freddie and Fannie lending, but let's say, it's, let's just call it AIG lending, uh, is the government going to let AIG fail or not? And so if, if not, then we're back to the problem that we are in today. Um, so the way, again, the way I, I see this issue is a little bit different. I, see this issue as primarily being an issue of, okay, now that you have levered up and now that a shock has occurred, what do you do next? And I think there it's, it's better if we think of this problem as a design problem when we are initially writing the financial contract to begin with. And we should incorporate the fact that there are going to be states of the world when there's going to be some bad aggregate shock, maybe that catastrophe, uh, shock that has been talked about before, but we should contract up front how we are going to react in the event of such a shock. So one, in the context of mortgage design, one possibility is that we talk about, we contract upon automatic loan modifications which are contingent on some large deviation of uh, the housing price index, for example. It talks about real uh, uh, innovation. We need to write, develop m new markets and you know, these kind of contracts the market has to be comfortable with. But I think this is one way where at least we don't involve any sort of commitment from the political side that they will either not bail out or that they will price these guarantees appropriately, which is really difficult to, to hope for or really difficult to implement in practice. Uh, rather, if you ex ante build this in, then it is in the market's expectations that the market is going to uh, 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 rebalance those losses or risks if we come to, an, to, to a scenario where you have high leverage coupled with a large system-wide shock. Let me, how much time do I have left? Five, five minutes, okay. Just to give an illustration of design matters, let me just give you one example from the recent crisis. Okay, this is what I was talking about, linking. Um, automatic modifications to house price drops. Let me just give you an example of why these ex ante designs matter, if I can only move forward. Okay. So here, this is a s small example, but still one way in which we already have difference across uh, states in the U.S. in the, in the, in the ex ante designing of the mortgages is, are the foreclosure laws. So as many of you may already know, states in the U.S. differ in 
the control or the power that lender has in the event of uh, mortgage default or delinquency. Uh, some uh, states give more power to the lender. They can automatically repossess the house and sell it. Those are called non-judicial states. You don't have to go through a judicial process. So lender has more power. In other states, the lender has less power, and so they have to go through a judicial system. So that makes foreclosure more costly and, uh, uh, and so less likely to be implemented as a result. And so what we do in this paper, this is with Amir Sufi and Francesco Trebi, uh, we exploit this variation across states in judicial, non-judicial uh, foreclosure laws and construct what we believe is a believable instrument, which is to say that the variation is only along this dimension of cost of foreclosure. Otherwise, these states or these mortgages that we look at look very much identical. And you can kind of see that already from this graph. So what uh, this graph is kind of the reduced form result on house prices. So you can see both in the judicial and non-judicial states, house prices going up kind of together and by the same magnitude until the slowdown happens and then you have the crisis, that's the dip down in house prices. But you can see one big difference, this is quite large, about 15 to 17 percentage points difference between the red line that corresponds to the low uh, foreclosure states, the judicial state where it's more difficult to foreclose, and the high foreclosure states. So when everyone comes in and knocks on the doors of the delinquent uh, borrower to say, okay, we are putting your house on the market, there's a feedback effect that infects the entire neighborhood. As you can see very clearly, that feedback effect is strong enough to generate a further drop of about 15 percentage points uh, in, in, in house prices. The same result is found on other real variables as well. This is uh, uh, other than house prices, it holds for uh, residential investment, but also more importantly, the same result holds for durable consumption as well. Again, proxied by purchase of new houses. As you see, if you live in a high foreclosure state, you see prices drop further around your neighborhood, your wealth falls, you cut back more on consumption at the same time, leading to a further depression in aggregate demand and, 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 and consumption. So these, the, the, the way we design these contracts up front have real consequences, and the more uh, 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 safety valves we put in place so that we allow for a more efficient redistribution of these losses across borrowers and lenders rather than concentrating those losses on only uh, a small uh, uh, segment of the population in these extreme times can be counterproductive for the, for the macroeconomy as a whole. So with that final thought, I'd like to thank you all for your, for your patience. Um, thanks very much to all the speakers. I um, thought since... Uh, Professor Gabriel wasn't going to be here with us today, that I would start off the um, discussion with the question that he had been seeking to answer, or at least part of the question, which is um, one that I think could be very useful to policymakers or for them to at least keep in mind as they start arguing about the future or how they're going to reform housing finance in this country. And that is what is the economic and or social benefit of home ownership? Is there one? What is the appropriate sort of goal for home ownership for the for this government to have? Yeah, everyone's looking at me. The, <laughs> the, the, uh, I'm, I'm like I'm like well known for being like the pro the pro ownership guy. Um, so 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 you know in the kinds of ways that people usually think about it, which is you know a community of homeowners is like a better community uh, in terms of how it's run and things like that. Uh, I think the evidence is is mixed at best. Um, most of the results that, that people attribute to home ownership, say less crime, uh, you know, greater uh, community involvement, uh, probably can be attributed to the fact that renters in the U.S. tend to be uh, short duration stayers and the you know, commitment to the community in terms of being sticking around a long time tends to be tied to home ownership but it's not because of home ownership. So in Europe, where you have a, a history of long-term renters, um, then they have the same investment in the communities and the properties that you would get from homeowners in the US. Just in the United States, uh, nearly 99% of leases are for a year or less, right? We have short-run homeowners in the US, uh, renters in the, in, in the US. Um, the, the, the one, um, uh, area in which it's possible that, that home ownership does lead to, uh, um, you know, positive outcomes uh, is in terms of civic engagement and investment in the community. That is, uh, there is a, a hypothesis at least that for, for 
households who actually own a piece of their town, then they are remunerated for actually having a better town, which is their house increases in value. Um, you can place as much weight on the, you know, this belief as you want, but it leads to things like willingness to invest in schools, even if you don't have children in school, because that investment in better schools shows that it's capitalized into your house value. Right? So, so that is the argument in which home ownership is, is socially optimal. Okay? That is not an argument, however, that the government needs to subsidize home ownership because their people are not providing benefits for each other, they're providing benefits to themselves. Um, and it is certainly not an argument that what we should do is subsidize more expensive houses, um, which is really where we are. I would like to maybe quickly jump in, uh, mostly agreeing with that. I think um, in a lot of metropolitan areas in the United States, there is just not much of a choice between renting and owning. Um, I think in a lot of places, if you're in a certain income bracket, the only types of houses that might meet your criteria are, are owner-occupied houses. So it's very hard to kind of um, consider the, the, the counterfactual. The other thing I would say for renting instead of owning is that, it, um, and Todd alluded to this, it does promote labor mobility. I think a lot of the difficulties that the US labor market ex is experiencing is that people are stuck in their homes because these homes are underwater and um, are not therefore unable to, to locate to where the jobs may be. Um, the US has, having a, a very flexible labor market in many other dimensions, and I think that's kind of an advantage that uh, we should try to preserve. I would just personally have a, you know, as a renter, have a follow-up question on that. Just, you know, what kind of changes or would we see in um, the rental market in the United States, or, or even what sort of steps would changes would need to be made to able to sort of facilitate more people renting than do now? I mean, it's uh, as you mentioned, um, you know, there, it isn't an option in a lot of places. To, there isn't a lot of rental stock. And then in places like D.C., it's actually very expensive. <laughs> is yeah, that, so, is someone besides me needs to start with this one. <laughs> I, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll take the counter view. Which, or, you know, the, the easiest way to, to subsidize uh, renting is to stop subsidizing homeowning. I mean, that's the, I mean I, just like it's hard to make an argument for, for uh you know, subsidizing homeowning, at least in, in you know, the 2011 United States. Um, we can leave aside whether it was a good policy for post-war America to do it. That might have been a very good policy. Um, but to do it in the current, economy, uh, the current uh, uh, country, um, there, there likewise doesn't seem to be any great reason to subsidize renting, right? We, leveling the playing field is probably a much more uh, appropriate policy. Um, I should make a distinction here, um, and, and this might actually lead to more discussion. Um, it is not at all clear to me that the issues that we have run into are ones of uh, uh, difficulties with home ownership, per se. Right? The issues we run into are, are problems of home owning in the presence of needing lots of leverage to do it. Right? So exactly what Stan was pointing out to, which is people being unable to move, that's not due to their house price falling. It's due to their house price falling and them also having a mortgage, so their house price fell below their mortgage amount. Right? So we might be able to accomplish what, what the kinds of things that we're looking for by, by you know, discouraging the use of leverage um, or finding ways to make borrowing portable or things like that rather than discouraging home ownership or encouraging renting. In fact, one thing I am actually concerned about is that if I own a house, uh, my ability to move to another location, you might be, does my house value fall below my mortgage? We tend to focus on that when the economy goes bad. Um, but when things were booming, people's fear were as renters, they would not be able to afford to buy a house in some other market where the prices were going up a lot, right? And that strikes me as the risk that we're not focusing on this year, but it's probably the risk that we're going to focus on six years from now. Um, and it doesn't, you know, I don't think we have any, any great a priori reason to say one's more important than the other. Um, okay. Uh, also, you know, I've, sorry, I've, I've never been this convincing in my entire life. I know. Life. I mean, you're, <laughs> maybe you're maybe done. these guys can go talk to my kids. <laughs> Um, I mean, just you know, the topic housing and the macro economy. Can you all discuss to what extent um, we hear a lot um, as a reporter covering Capitol Hill that uh, you know uh, hand wringing and, and calls for action on the on the foreclosure crisis front? 
Um, and one question uh, some myself and some of my colleagues have been trying to ask is to what extent, or answers, to what extent has the failure of any government assistance or any kind of real a attack on this issue forestalled the recovery of the housing market? Can you all speak to that? Or, or has there actually been a, a positive benefit? I'll take that one. Um, I, I think the last graph that I showed you, uh, at least uh, to me, is quite clear on the, uh, at least the immediate effect of foreclosure. You can say in the long run they might be better off clearing the market and all that. That's, you know, new data will come and we, we, we'll see. But at least in the short run, in the one to two year horizon, uh, the data tells us very clearly that when we exploit this variation in state laws and creating artificially more foreclosures, so to speak, you can see a big negative impact on house prices and also on investment and consumption in those areas, in precisely those uh, areas. Now that's something that is very much directly policy relevant in terms of you know, how we design bankruptcy uh, regulations, for example, and how we allow the foreclosure process to go through, and it goes back to sort of what I was trying to talk about, which is that we need to take into account these scenarios at the macroeconomic level up front from a legislation perspective and say, look, if we come to a situation of such aggregate shocks, then we need to respond perhaps differently as a society. Otherwise, you have these vicious cycles on the downside that can uh, create uh, further disruption. In your research, has there been any sort of specific, I mean, I know you touched on some, but is there any sort of concrete proposals that you could say, you know, this would have been good to have in place, or even after the, cri after the crisis hit, these would have been good steps for the government to have taken to kind of alleviate that crisis? On I think, the foreclosure front? yeah, generally speaking, my, my personal take is that gen mechanisms that would have, that would have eased the, loan uh, modification system without creating a moral hazard that is obvious if you just allow everyone to modify. So I think, you know, and there are ways to go about doing that, just like I referenced. One of them is to index things to, like, stuff that individuals have no control over, like, you know, regional house price drops and things of that sort. So yes, you can think of mechanisms where you can design loan modification mechanisms which are not subject to the individual moral hazard problem that, that banks worry about. And I think the, uh, the, the economy overall might be better off as a result of it. Uh, but again, it's something that has to be looked into in more detail, but broadly speaking, yes, uh, I can think of some. So can I ask a question for Atif? Sure. Okay, so, so one thing I mean, that, that maybe you have a sense of, um, you, it, it seems like when we have a, a, a foreclosure issue or a default issue, um, that uh, you, if we had a more effective or expedient uh, ability to, to foreclose on homes, right? do, you, do you have a sense of that? Does that make things better or does it make things worse? Right? So, so is it, is it, is it the, what's going on in terms of price declines due to a contagion of there are lots of foreclosures on my block? Or is it, well, we're not sure how the houses are going to be dealt with in foreclosure and it's all sort of messy and murky and so there's a price haircut that goes along with buying a foreclosed home? It seems like those have very different implications for what we want to do, whether we want to ungum up the works or not. Right. Um, I, I don't have much of an answer for your question because I just don't have that level of detail to answer uh, your question. And as you know, as economists, you're always very hesitant to make welfare or efficiency statements. I don't want to make too many of those. I've already made more than I usually do in papers. Um, um, but you know, the most I can say is that in the short run, you can see those very large immediate effects. In the long run, it's, it is still possible that you know, those areas rebound faster because they've kind of cleared that backlog at a, at a faster pace. But then you know, data is coming, and we'll know the answer to that at least. Question. Yes, um, yes go ahead. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll point out that um, the foreclosure problem is so difficult because if you think of it from a lender perspective, they're afraid of two things. One is that they'll relax the terms on a mortgage and then it will redefault. So not only will they have made less money, but then they'll still be facing the ultimate default. The other risk is that they will modify the terms on a mortgage that actually wouldn't have defaulted anyway. It turns out it's pretty hard to figure out who would have defaulted in absence of forbearance. And so you take that kind of double-edged uncertainty for the banks on top of the fact that many of them still are not long on capital um, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of potential losses, and so, you know, to, to come to an agreement about what to do in a foreclosure between the borrower and lender is really hard, and when the government comes in and sort of puts some money into the works, it makes it a little bit easier, but if you think about how much money it would take to throw in to actually um, 
create a wider band where bargaining might happen, it, it seems to be quite a bit of money. So I just think it's one of those problems where it's incredibly complicated to actually think about how it could resolve itself quickly. So that's just sort of a pessimistic take on, you know, it, it, that's why it's so hard to come right. up with policies or that the existing policies, I think, haven't solved more of the problem because it has been so hard. And nobody's to, been willing, there's not the political appetite to put in the amounts of money as you said, that would. Right, so there's fact. actually not the money. So. <laughs> or there just isn't the money. Well, there's always that too. Um, well, I'd like to open it up to questions. Um, yeah, over here in the front. Yeah. Yes, that the, the um, that it's not, per, that foreclosures in some sense are not Pareto optimal, they're not efficient. Will the, will the panelists care to comment on that? Uh, do you agree, disagree? Uh, is it best to, force for foreclosures and speed them up? Is that, is that the parental improving thing to do? Or is dragging it out the, the Pareto improving thing to do? Um, I, I think the panel probably differs in opinion on this. It sounds like Atif would uh, prefer like a dragging out policy. I think ultimately a lot of these loans redefault. I think Joe Tracy, who's sitting uh, at your table, has done some careful study on, on, on that. I think a lot of these, um, fixes are very temporary in nature and um, are ultimately just kind of delaying the recognition of the problem. I think just following up on what uh, Professor Lucas was saying earlier, I think often there's not a lot of gains from trade and even when there are gains from trade between the borrower and the lender, often uh, the lender is not willing to recognize them because it would further impair their balance sheet. And so I think um, my personal view would be kind of the faster we can, we can work our way through these foreclosures. Um, and the faster we can recognize the losses, um, the faster we'll be on the path towards recovery. I, I guess um, just to, I don't have a number in my mind, but just to think about the sort of the magnitude of the cost, the issue is that if someone is 150% underwater, you have to come up with a lot of money. Even if they don't have to bring them down to 100%, even if it was 110, that's still a substantial amount of money. And that also speaks to the fact that some foreclosures are maybe theoretically curable, but in others, people simply can't afford their houses. So it'd be hard to imagine a deal between a bank and a borrower that would make economic sense or be Pareto improving. So, um, so I mean, so that's the issue is, uh, I mean, obviously the only thing that would sort of take care of the problem would be any policy that raised all housing prices because it's sort of the underwaterness of these mortgages that's creating the sort of the magnitude of the problem. And with house prices low and mortgages fixed, it's, it's hard to make it all add up. I'll just add one thing. I think for, for all the reasons that uh, Debbie Lucas mentioned, it's very hard to tackle the foreclosure problem ex post, which is the world we are living in right now. The point I was trying to make was that it's better to design something ex ante so that it's priced in already, that this was the expectation that we would to, to minimize the whole foreclosure thing to begin with, because it's really, it's, it's for all the reasons that I've already mentioned, it's really messy to now solve this problem, try to do it ex post, because you know, the contract has written expectations that are set and so on and so forth. But if you allow for that flexibility ex ante, then people know what the risks they're getting into and those are priced up front, and then if those events occur, then it's easier to resolve them in a quicker manner. It's also uh, instructive to think about uh, what was the source of the uh, stress on the borrower. So we've highlighted a number of different uh, possible situations. One where the borrower simply couldn't afford uh, the mortgage unless house prices continued to increase. We have borrowers who are suffering you know, steep house price declines, so that's the negative equity, even if they can afford the monthly payments. And then you have borrowers who are suffering a temporary reduction in income. And that's not an inconsequential uh, segment of the stress in the markets, especially when the recession hit. And there are policies that leave the mortgage in place in that case. Pennsylvania's had a very long-running program of the state financing, in some sense, uh, loans to these homeowners who are suffering temporary job loss, when at least to their assessment, there's a, a reasonable probability of reemployment and the person being able to resume payments. So I think it is important to sort of tailor uh, whatever our intervention is to what we think is the source of the problem. Are there any other questions? Oh, over here. <laughs> 
Dr. Lucas, in your presentation, correct me if I'm wrong, but in pricing that subsidy um, using your put option, which essentially the counterparty is the U.S. government, but there was a difference in what you said the Fannie or Freddie price was. And, and kind of what's the th theory behind that or reasoning? Right. So um, at, that was simply because they had slightly different leverage ratios at the time that we were calibrating the model. I mean, the, the big issue is the same for both, and they just had, you know, slightly different portfolios, slightly different situations, slightly different current equity prices. So a lot of what the method does is it looks at stock prices and takes that data pretty literally. I mean, you're giving me the opportunity to say something I'd like to say about that approach to pricing risk. Um, as people at this conference alluded to, we all thought they might blow up because of interest rate or prepayment risk, and there really wasn't much expectation that it would have been credit risk. Um, that sort of market price approach to pricing the risk isn't looking under the hood at what it's coming from. Those, those estimates were based on what the market perception was of interest rate and prepayment and credit risk. And I'm not saying the market had it right, but, or even fraud risk. So it's sort of all the, when you look at the volatility of stock prices to get a sense of the riskiness of an institution, you are getting a very holistic picture of the risk. You're not necessarily putting a name on it. So um, that, that's sort of a getting, I think, at the, what you're asking about. Thank you very much.